Yeah, so I'll, I'll mention a little later how we got the name Jersey Muskrats. Uh, and, and I don't want to do a complete history of them because uh, this is about the Bermuda 100 campaign. That in itself is, is, uh, is, is, is what we're here for tonight. But um, they, uh, they were formed in the fall of 1861, uh, September and October. And as I mentioned, went right through until uh, 1865. So again, while I'm not gonna talk about all their history, I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the good they did and the bad and the, uh, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, the oh so ugly. So I know we don't, we're all <laughs> muted, so I don't know if that drew a chuckle there or not with, uh, with uh, Mr. Butler, but Actually, the ninth had it doubly ugly because uh, they probably spent more than half of their three years, over three years in service with these two guys. And um, I know most of you are aware these weren't the best uh, Union generals in the, in the Army, far from. Uh, although, you know, I, I think they both certainly had their moments. I'm going to talk about one shortly uh, and briefly about Ambrose Burnside, but, um, but we really are talking about uh, Ben Butler. You look at that cartoon down there, most of you are familiar with that under Burnside. It's uh, Columbia. This is after Fredericksburg and Columbia's yelling at Lincoln, Burnside and, and Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War. And she's saying, you murdered my 15,000 sons. And, and Lincoln is replying in the cartoon. You know, that reminds me of a joke and you know, you, most of you familiar, that was a big thing with Lincoln. And of course she tells him where him and his joke can go, go back to Springfield. And Butler, well, we can go on and on about some of the names. He's, he, 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 he ended up with Spoons and uh, Beast Butler and, you know, his picture in the bottom of a chamber pot and so on. But we will be, we'll, we will be talking mainly about Ben Butler, but you know, other, other people get to talk about their ancestors serving under Sheridan or Sherman or Patrick Claiborne or, you know, Farragut or something like that. And my brother and sister and I get to, uh, you know, we get to talk about our ancestor here under these two guys. Um, but again, like I said, I think they both had some moments, but they'll certainly be forever remembered as not so good military generals. But here's a guy I'm going to talk about a lot, uh, General Charles Heckman. He becomes the second colonel of the regiment, and I'll explain. And that, that was quick. It was even before their first battle, and I'll get to that in in, in just a in just a minute. But this is a guy that grew up in Easton, Pennsylvania. Was educated in Easton, Pennsylvania, and during the Mexican the Mexican American War, he enlisted in 1847 in in a one year. Uh, some of you more familiar with the Mexican-American War will know there were nine national infantry regiments that Congress authorized to support the, the, the Union Army, the United States Army at the time. And Heckman joined what was called the Regiment of Voltageurs and Foot Riflemen. And at the time, I found that I had no idea what that was. Again, some of you may be more familiar with that, but on paper and in theory, what it was supposed to be was a, a regiment of mixed men on horses and on foot so that the guy on the horse would have a, a, a foot soldier next to him or behind him. So when it was in close, uh, close encounter, they could advance rapidly. Uh, just a weird concept. I had never even heard of that. And uh, to my knowledge, that was never, that was never enforced. But that regiment served under, uh, well, their, their lieutenant colonel was uh, Joseph E. Johnston. Uh, and I'm sure most people in here are familiar with him later with the Confederate Army. But they did serve a year in the Mexican War. Uh, he, he rose to sergeant. And then, uh, and then when, when he was discharged in 1848, but back to Easton. But then he crossed over to Phillipsburg, New Jersey, right across the river up in North Jersey there. And, um, he worked for the Central New Jersey Railroad. And when the war broke out, he would become the Lieutenant Colonel of the 9th New Jersey. Um, certainly his experience in the Mexican War helped him with that. Um, 
he, he will go on later, and, and I, I, want, I put this up there because my hunch is that most of you are familiar with many of these brigades on here. Certainly, you know, the F Vermont Iron Brigade, Irish Brigade, First Jersey Brigade, Excelsior, Philadelphia, and so on. But my hunch is not many people have ever heard of Heckman's Brigade. And uh, he did command a brigade, and, and we'll talk about that here at Drury's Bluff, but it was ninth overall in casualties, according to Fox's, uh, Lieutenant F Colonel Fox's uh, uh, writings after the war. I, and uh, I, again, my hunch is that not many people will know that, and yet many people are so familiar with, with some of the other names on, on this list. So let me jump ahead here. Uh, just briefly, uh, a little bit of history, and then we will move on uh, to, to tonight's topic. But uh, how he became the lieutenant colonel, this is a very crude map, very crude. I just put it together to, to kind of show that early on in February of 1862, as part of Burnside's expedition to um, Roanoke Island, the, which the Union took, they... Um, the, the colonel, Joseph Allen, en route to this battle, the convoy of ships off the coast of, of uh, North Carolina in late January, they, they hit rough weather. And the officers had gone on, um, I guess you would call them like little surf boats or small boats traveling in between uh, the ships to have a staff meeting with General Burnside. And en route back to the uh, Annie Thompson, which was most of the night New Jersey were on. Uh, the storm bl blew up and the, uh, sur the little surf boats capsized. And the Colonel Joseph Allen, their surgeon Weller, and a, and a sailor, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, uh, they drowned. Heckman and, and a bunch of the officers ended up in the drink. Uh, they survived, but uh, he would end up uh, taking command. So he gets command of the ninth unofficially, he'll get promoted officially uh, uh, later, but he, he assumes command of the ninth right before their first battle at, at Roanoke Island. And at Roanoke Island, it, it's not covered a lot. I mean, they had some casualties, 60 killed overall, you know, both sides, 272 wounded, and they will eventually, the Union will eventually capture uh, General Henry Wise. And I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with him. For those not, General Wise was, uh, he was in command of the Confederate troops at Roanoke. But he was the governor of Virginia when John Brown raided Harper's Ferry. And he was the governor who signed the death warrant for John, uh, for John Brown. So he becomes a political general when the war begins because he's no longer no longer um, the governor of Virginia. But we'll, we'll, we'll see his name again when we get to uh, Bermuda 100. Oh, by the way, he was also the brother-in-law of General uh, George Gordon Meade. I, I believe that it was his second, he was married a bunch of times. I think it was his second wife and General Meade's wife were sisters. So he's a, he's a relative of, um, of General Meade. But the Union, the Union will end up, uh, the ninth especially, it'll be down here at New Bern, there'll be in some battles here at Goldsburg and Kingston, and just in, the, just in these campaigns down here between New Bern, Goldsburg, and Kingston, they got like tw almost 2,400 casualties. The ninth had 10 killed, 200 wounded in these, in these campaigns down here. But the, the bottom line is they, they end up securing all this in blue for the remainder of the war. From February of 62, February 7th actually, which is like a day after, I, th I think it was a day after the day of, uh, Grant taken uh, Fort, um, yeah, what's the fort? Not Donaldson, uh, Fort Henry. And, Henry. And, then, and, then, uh, and, and ends up taking Fort Donaldson. So, um, you know, it's around the same time period. Certainly, they're not going to get the coverage with what Grant's doing out there. So they secure that, and 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 a lot of emphasis is put on that. I I I think it's really important uh, that they control that for the for the entire war, especially for the North Atlantic, uh, uh, the, 
the, the, block, the blocking squadron, the North Atlantic fleet. So certainly it was important, but again, in the big scheme of things with the bigger campaigns, it just doesn't, just doesn't get the coverage. So we're here really to talk about uh, Bermuda 100, which when Grant came east in March of 1864, and again, many of you are aware of this, he put together this overall five uh, campaign of five, five campaigns moving simultaneously. And it's supposed to have, we're supposed to have banks down here uh, in New Orleans going to Mobile, that gets all botched. Certainly Sherman going to Atlanta, uh, you know, you all know the outcome of that. Um, but up here in the, um, up here, Siegel going to the Shenandoah, that gets stumped down at Newmarket. So that doesn't work out. But here's the big one that we're, we're talking about. Meade and the Army of the Potomac with, with Grant, uh, having his, his command in the field and Butler. And, and the plan there is for the Army of the Potomac to head south to Richmond. Butler's gonna come in from the east and head north um, up the James River, similar to what was, what was planned in 62, May of 62, part of the Peninsula Campaign. So that's the plan. And, and the idea is uh, all five armies moving at the same time, it's going to be hard for the Confederates to reinforce each other at any point. So uh, a brilliant plan, I think, by, by Grant. So these will be the two guys in charge of, on the Union side and the, um, and the Confederate side. If you look at, at the, the Army of the James, Butler is in charge of it. And I'm not so sure Grant was happy that, uh, that although he did end up having the final say, and I think Butler really, uh, when, when he discussed the plan, kind of talked himself into it. But um, Grant decides he's going to offset Butler's lack of being a good military commander with two West Point graduates, Quincy Gilmore, and um, William Farrar, Baldy Smith. That ends up, and Grant will even write about it later, was a big mistake. I mean, these three guys absolutely did not get along. They just did not get along. And in, and in Baldy Smith's case, uh, even Grant wrote about them mocking everybody's plan except his own, Smith's. Um, Smith, had nothing good to say about any of his subordinates. You know, he, I guess he just figured with two West Point guys here uh, and, and Butler being a political general and not much, not much of a general at that, he was going to offset it. But he does end up with, I, I think, some, some uh, you know, a couple of good division commanders there. You got um, Alfred Terry, John Turner, Adelbert Ames, William Brooks, Godfrey Weitzel, which is uh, Weitzel, which is uh, the ninth, will be in his division, and then Edward Hanks. And Hank, Hanks will command the um, the the U.S. colored troops. The, his whole division, the third division, will be all the U.S.C. troops. So the Army to James, I really just put this up here to show the the just how little New Jersey was represented. The ninth is the only infantry unit in the entire Army of the James. They're it. There are no other. And in fact, most of the Army of the James was New England, New York. You know, it was an Illinois regiment, an Ohio regiment, the ninth. But for the most part, the Army of the James was, was generally made up of uh, New England regiments, New York, and, and, and so on. So the ninth will be the only one. The fourth and fifth artillery, they will be part of the 10th Corps, first and second division, respectively. And this is the army to Beauregard, and I put pickup team. I actually stole this this term from uh, from a couple of historians that use it a lot, and that's exactly what it is. And I hope to hope to show that in the next couple of slides. Beauregard doesn't start out with this at all. Beauregard is in he's he's in in South Carolina at the time uh, that he ends up with command. But this is what he's going to end up with. He's going to end up with Robert Hulk. Uh, with Alfred Colquitt and Robert Ransom and uh, William Chase Whiting. William Chase Whiting, we're going to talk a lot about him at the end of uh, at the end of the Bermuda 100 campaign because this was kind of the weak link that I believe link uh, that sunk Beauregard's plan. 
And before I forget, uh, in my mind, uh, all the research I've done over the years on this, I really do believe this was Beauregard's, his finest hour in the Civil War. And, and, and I hope to explain that in a few slides here. He literally is throwing this, this uh, team together on the fly between South Carolina and Weldon, then Petersburg. He's sick in the meantime, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So here's the plan. So the plan is, let me get this. Uh, I got my, uh, I want to get rid of this. The screen thing is showing up. Let me get rid of this. Bear with me a minute. Hopefully you guys aren't seeing that. You're not seeing the, the, the bar of the bottom of share screen and participants and all, are you? Okay. No, we're not. Yeah, it's for some reason it's it's all mine. Okay. So here's the plan. Uh, Grant's going to leave uh, heading down towards the wilderness on May 5th. Butler's supposed to come up. Um, same day he's going to leave, and he's going to head up towards Richmond from the south. That, that's the plan. And I, I want to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that because, let me go back. I want to come back to that because, uh, or at the end, because there's so much controversy on what, what Grant said, what he didn't say, what he expected, what Butler thought. Um, the general thinking was this, and, and I'm going to actually read, I'll read Grant's exact words when we get to the end, but it, it basically told Butler, your objective is Richmond. Stay on the south side of the James River, and as you head and advance, your objective is Richmond. That's in writing, but we're, we're going to cover that controversy, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you are familiar with that controversy. So I just put this one up here brief to kind of show if, if uh, for those that remember, in, in May, it's almost a year, it was almost two years to the day, May 15th, 1862, when the Union tried to come up, up the James River towards Richmond, when they got stumped, the Navy got stumped at Drury's Bluff. This was part of the Peninsula Campaign, um, the many, many battles and, and engagements during, during that, that campaign. But I think you can see here why, why that was the problem. You got the Union has to come around two curves here and then hit um, Fort Darling, which is uh, on the heights of Drury's Bluff, overlooking it with cannons. I mean, they just didn't have a chance. There was no way for the Navy to navigate through there. Two curves and a fortress with, with artillery and height firing down on them. And they got stumped there. So they didn't even try it in 1864. Uh, the Navy had recommended, back in 1862, had recommended that they offload troops below Drury's Bluff, which is what ends up becoming part of this part of this problem. Here's what it looks like today. It's still, you know, here's that curve way down here and coming around the second curve. And just to give you a couple other views of observation, obviously this vegetation wouldn't have been here at the time. So what so the Army to James is all set. They, they, got, they got all these regiments and, you know, people been training and, and they're all organized and Grant's been planning and Butler's been planning, but what about the Confederates? Well, inside the red here, um, this, this, is, this is Department of Southern Virginia and North Carolina under the command of George Pickett. At the time, Butler and the Army to James land on May 5th, Pickett's got 1,400 men. The army to James has 39,000. I mean, Pickett is just, here's, a, here's another uh, guy that shined. Pickett shined during this, and, and I'm sure you're all aware, this is much after uh, his uh, situation at Gettysburg uh, the year before. But um, Pickett does an exceptional job here, holding the fort, so to speak, uh, until Butler can, can come up. So you got, you got, Pickett with 1,400 men guarding from his department from the south side of the James River up at the top here down to the northern uh, border of South Carolina. 
you got Robert Ransom in charge of what was called the Department of Richmond. And uh, a, a lot of his guys are old men and young kids, so, boys too young to be conscripted, and, and, and guys like 60 and so on like that. It's not his, his entire army. He's, he's got some soldiers, but he's got a small uh, garrison because everybody's up with Lee. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to block Grant from coming down through the wilderness in Spotsylvania and, and, and so on. And then you got um, General Beauregard, and he's in charge of the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And he, as I said earlier, he is in uh, Columbia at the time. Um, and in, on April 14th, he is given command of they're going to merge the departments of Richmond and Southern Virginia and North Carolina and put Butler, I uh, put uh, Beauregard, I'm sorry, Be uh, Beauregard in charge. But he doesn't get to weld in North Carolina until April 22nd and become sick immediately. So around, on, on, not around, but on May 5th, when the Army of the James is landing, um, they're landing troops at City Point. They're landing troops at Bermuda 100. Um, Pickett's going nuts trying to trying to explain to uh, you know the Confederate authorities in Richmond. But Jeff Davis got a little bit more on his mind. Then he he's got to find a way to to to, to support uh, Robert E. Lee. So Pickett's just not getting Pickett's not really getting the kind of help that he that he needs. I don't know. I don't want to just say what he wants, but what he needs. Um, so Beauregard on the fly, heading up the heading up the Weldon, is 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 ordering troops. He is pulling troops from everywhere he can. He's pulling troops from Tennessee, from uh, Southwest Virginia, from North Carolina. He's got Hoke's division coming up. He's got he's just grabbing people, and he's also stopping. Uh, 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 he stopped a couple of brigades that were en route to to the north to help Robert E. Lee. So. Um, again, so you can see where he puts this uh, on the fly. He doesn't even get to Petersburg until um, uh, till like May 5th, something like that. Um, and he's in Petersburg, Beauregard. He's in Petersburg at the point of um, Burnside Landon. So the commander in the field is still really picket. And, and Pickett's got like a regiment here. He's got a regiment there. Again, 1,400 men. He's, he quickly gets a couple brigades. Uh, um, Johnson Haygood and Bushrod Johnson's uh, brigades get up there quick, and, and they get up there in the nick of time. Because here we go. Butler is landing. So, again, it's May 5th. He's landing. And the first thing they do is they, they secure a Bermuda 100, they secure City Point, and they start entrenching. And that night, Butler meets with, um, with Quincy Gilmore and, and Baldy Smith. And he sits down with them, and here he had just gotten some good intelligence from operatives of uh, Elizabeth Van Loo. Most of you know, you know, crazy bet. They get some pretty good information that Richmond is lightly defended. And Butler wants to move. He wants to move. It's mid, it's, it's night, but there's a moon, moonlight, and he wants to move. Baldy Smith and Quincy Gilmore just refuse. They just they talk him out of it. And Smith doesn't refuse, but there, there are some records that indicate Quincy Gilmore told him that if he was ordered, he would disobey. So they talk him out of it. And Butler... I guess just didn't have it in them. You know, another general I, I couldn't imagine would just maybe order them. I, I, I you know, it, it's just surprising to me, but uh, they talk him out of it. So the next day on May 5th, I mean, uh, May 6th, uh, Butler decides he's going to send, he's going to send some troops. Uh, we're going to do some recon out, out west here. We're going to head towards, the, they really should be hitting the railroad. Because that's another thing that, that later Grant would say. Grant, Grant's thinking was Butler was supposed to secure Bermuda 100, and then he was supposed to cut the Petersburg and Richmond Railroad so the 
so the South couldn't get troops up to Robert E. Lee. And then he was supposed to hook up with Meade at Richmond. Grant will write that later, that, that his understanding of what, but it's not in the writing, it was in a, apparently in a verbal conversation between the two. And of course, Grant and Butler both end up with two different versions of what, uh, what was said. But he, he's sort of doing this, Butler. He, he's going to have his, he's going to have his uh, mission go, or his uh, expedition heading west. And they do. And they end up in a place called Port Walthall. And at Port Walthall, that battle between um, May 6th and May 7th, they'll have, let me look at the exact numbers here so I get it right. It's 208 killed, 268 wounded, 53 missing. Okay. Um, and on that one, what's shocking to me is that Butler had ordered Baldy Smith to send a brigade and Quincy Gilmore to send a brigade. Quincy Gilmore didn't send a brigade. And when questioned about it afterwards, never gave a reason. He simply said he, he had good reason, but never specified what that was. I, you know, I just, in the army I was in, I, I just can't imagine that, that happening. I, you know, I just can't imagine that happening. But uh, apparently it did. The biggest discipline that I found that Butler uh, would do or, or a, a, a bad response against Quincy Gilmore for this was that he wrote to, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the senator's name, but apparently there was a, a confirmation hearings going on in Washington for a promotion for Quincy Gilmore. Um, he, he was a major general here, but this is in the volunteer army, but uh, the 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 uh, hearings were supposed to be for his lieutenant colonelcy in the regular army, and Butler tried to put a stop to that because of the insubordination and the lack of cooperation. Um, it's it, it's just mind-boggling to me. But anyway, that that battle is on the sixth and the seventh, and here's the craziest part of it all: May eighth, they take the day off. They take the day off. Butler's got them uh, entrenching more back at Bermuda 100. They're not going to go look for Confederates. They're not going to do anything. And this is just buying more time and more time and more time for the Confederates, for Beauregard to get uh, his ducks all lined up. So on the, on finally on May 9th, they continue heading out, trying to, trying to, find, uh, trying to find Confederates and also to try to uh, tear up the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad. And he's also, he's, in the meantime, he's got August, Cal, uh, August uh, Calps, the um, cavalry commander, tearing up. Now, they're not going to tear up anything like Sherman's army or other armies did throughout the war, but they do, there are stretches along the road, both south and north of Petersburg, they do tear up, you know, a mile here, a couple hundred yards there, but they don't, they're not completely successful in doing that, but they are, they are trying to do that. So in that battle there at Swift Creek, another uh, casualty thing, 39 killed for the Union, 100 wounded, 137 killed and wounded for the Confederate. Heckman's brigade alone include the ninth, which was in the lead, 13 killed and, and half of the wounded, half of the 100 were from the 9th New Jersey. Uh, and what do they do? They pull back and they retreat. So Butler and Quincy Gilmore and Baldy Smith get together and they come up with a plan. And the idea is they're going to go through again the next day, they're going to attack Swift Creek, break through the defenses and head towards Petersburg. And Butler leaves, the door hits him in the butt. And Quincy Gilmore and Boley Smith said, well, you know what? That's what he wants to do. What are we going to do? So they come up with another plan. And they put it together, and that's to cross by some pontoons, uh, something that they will do later and will be successful. But they changed the plans on Butler after to his face telling him that they agree with the plan. And Butler's incensed. He's just absolutely incensed. He gets a, a, you know, the memo from them later that night saying, hey, we changed the plans, boss. And um, he's not happy with that at all. So 
Coincidentally, Butler gets uh, a telegram from Secretary of War Stanton, which ended up being wrong, but I mean, it was a legitimate message, but he said that Grant had defeated Lee at Spotsylvania and was pushing Lee's army back towards Richmond. And of course, you know, many of you know, that's not exactly what happened. I mean, we still got North Anna and we got Cold Harbor, you know, so, but uh, Butler interprets this that, well, he's got to get back to his original plan, which was to meet, meet General Meade at, at Richmond. So he, he discontinues any plans going to Swift Creek and P Petersburg, and he, he starts heading north. And they get to Chester Station here. There had been a couple Union regiments, two or three regiments, guarding this to begin with. Uh, but uh, Beauregard had sent a couple brigades from Ransom's division south to attack them. And um, they could have overtaken them because it's like two brigades against two or three Union regiments. But uh, General Terry over here back at Bermuda 100 sent a couple brigades to reinforce. And then also as Smith's armies coming north to Chester Station, they happened to get there in time and they, they salvaged that. But that's another one. There's like uh, 529 killed, wounded, missing, and captured in that. So you got you got a lot of 100 here, 100 there, a couple hundred there. These casualties are starting to add up in this campaign. The big one I want to get to is Drury's Bluff. This is the big, big battle, the big battle of um, this campaign. I'm going to skip over it a minute to show you that after that, after that battle and they start to retreat back to Bermuda 100, there'll be another one at Ware Bottom Church, okay? And they'll lose 15 to 1,700 there. So this is, that's a big one. But so there are, there are a lot of different battles going on in this campaign, but I want to come back to Drury's Bluff. So this is what it looks like on, on May 16th. There's, there, there's, there's Lewis Murphy, my ancestor, and Mary's ancestor, the 9th New Jersey. I have to tell you, when I first found this, when I first seen this map a few years ago, I looked at it and I really didn't understand the battle. I didn't understand what was going on yet. I was still trying to learn. When I first looked at it, I thought, wow, this is just the opposite of the 20th Maine. You know, this isn't exactly the fish hook, but you, you, you get to see the, the, union line, the union's online. And instead of on the left flank with the 20th Maine going, living in the glory, the nice on the right, and I thought, wow, man, you know, like, you know, I wonder if it'll turn out just like that. They'll have the same fame that the 20th Maine. Well, that ain't going to happen at all, because what happens is on May 16th, um, Beauregard has Ransom's entire division, four brigades, attack one brigade, Heckman's brigade. And the 9th New Jersey actually was about 500 yards in the front. They had, a, they had an advanced outpost. The regiment was out about 500 yards in advance. So they're the first to get hit. I mean, they just, they, they're decimated. The entire brigade is decimated. It's in the fog. And um, this is sort of what the Union right line would have looked like. And, and after this battle, the Confederates, as you can see along here, it's now stretched on this angle. And... Um, Hoke will then attack what now is the Union right. But before that, Butler, before Hoke attacked, Butler wanted Gilmore to attack, and he didn't. And, and again, this is mind-boggling to me that he didn't. He just didn't. Um, there were some, you know, there were some skirmishing and all going on back and forth. Uh, a regiment here would advance. They'd be pushed back. That's kind of going on. But once Hulk division, Hulk's division attacked the Union, what is now the right, because this entire right had, had collapsed, um, Baldy Smith panics and tells Butler he's retreating. And now Gilmore sees his flank is open, and he goes to Butler and says, look, we, we got to get out of here, boss. We, we just got, you know, I'm, I'm stuck out here. And Butler finally agrees, and then they they – they retreat. So I mentioned General Whiting uh, in the back. This was part of this was part of Beauregard's plan, and I, I really think Beauregard. I 
and I'm sure most of you know, he's noted for these elaborate, complex plans in, in a battle, but I, I really believe this was a very sound plan. Um, the idea was he, he was going to attack the, the Union from the north, and Whiting was going to come in from the rear. It was clear. It was, it was a good plan. And he would stop any retreat of the Union back into Bermuda 100. But that doesn't happen. Whiting got to Port Walthall. He saw a couple regiments under, under command of Adelbert Ames. Adelbert Ames, his division had gotten sort of divided up. They, they pulled a couple up into uh, Drury's Bluff. And um, I believe one was between there, Port Walthall Junction and Bermuda 100. And he also had left the, uh, Butler had left the entire third division back in his rear guarding um, Bermuda 100 and City Point. So what happened with Whiting was that um, some, initially uh, years ago, there was a, a accounts that said he was drunk. He did have a drinking problem. There's no, there's no doubt about that. He had a drinking problem, but a couple of historians who've done some research in recent years indicate he wasn't drunk. He was just exhausted from um, you know, lack of sleep and the stress of the command, but he misinterpreted uh, the couple regiments. He really believed that the Union plan was to attack Petersburg, and he, he was it. He was it to hold Petersburg. But he should have been able to continue past Warthol, Port Walthall Junction. He should have been able to defeat um, Adelbert Ames with only uh, two regiments. He had, he had uh, two brigades. He had cavalry on both sides of his flank. He had artillery. Uh, he, he really should have done that, but he, he didn't. And the, the, the most accounts say part of the reason that he didn't advance um, in addition to thinking that Petersburg was the goal, was he never heard the firing, which, which Beauregard had told him, when you hear the firing, you're to advance and, and catch Butler in the rear. He never heard that, and that's been chalked off to the acoustic uh, shadow, uh, which, which, happens in, which happened in a couple battles. So what happens is Butler's able to retreat. Okay, they're able to retreat back into Bermuda 100. So the outcome of just this battle, 64, whoops, 6,400, 6, um, casualties. And if you look there, the ninth, uh, 18 killed, 163 wounded, 58 missing, 45 of those will die in Andersonville prison and 227 total. And, um, you know, a, a term that I heard a couple of years ago with uh, uh, the Battle of Bermuda 100, that it really was an insignificant campaign. And uh, I, I would uh, have trouble, and I think the families of all these 6,400 uh, casualties would, would beg to differ that it was very significant to them. All right, so a lot of casualties, a lot of casualties. Heckman's brigade alone is decimated. Um, as you can see here, and uh, the 27th Mass especially, 120 of their men died in Andersonville prison. So uh, again, to tell them it's not significant, all right? So they, they, they take a big hit there. One good thing is that the newspapers down in the South wrote up uh, about Heckman, and this is one thing they will say that we congratulate General Beauregard on his victory over Beast Butler and have the lively satisfaction of the destruction of Heckman's brigade and capture of its daring commander. It's about the best accolades that I think Heckman got during his career. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the last bottom, the last uh, battle rather, is uh, at, uh, at uh, Weir Bottom Church here. And this particular map, I really should, it should be turned to where the Union, uh, uh, Union troops are on the right and the Confederates on the left to make it more accurate to north-south, all that stuff. Um, but all the other maps I saw were just so grainy and all, I thought this was the clearer to kind of show it. 
And you see here the union picket line here. And if you remember earlier when I said Butler did a lot of entrenching, well, here's where one part where it came in, in handy because the entrenchments all the way back here ended up, is it really ended up with stopping um, Beauregard's uh, troops from getting through. They did break through the advanced picket lines up here, but they, they, they had their trouble with the entrenchments. And then that will set up what is known as the Howlett line. And of course, this is a more accurate north, south, east, west map here to kind of show you with the cork in the bottom. And, and something about this, Grant never said that. Grant, well, Grant said it, but Grant didn't coin the phrase. He did not coin the phrase, and he later regretted it. He, 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 he wrote in his memoirs, he shouldn't, have, he shouldn't have used that. He should have put it in quotation marks. But it was his chief, uh, chief engineer, uh, General John Bernard, who, who, who wrote that on a slip of paper when he was trying to explain to uh, Grant what happened to Butler down, down here. But a lot, of, a lot has been written that, that Butler was, was trapped. And that's so far from the truth. He's not trapped. He's, he's bottled up where he can't leave Bermuda 100 and, and advance this way up to Richmond. He's bottled up that way. But I, I want to show you where I believe Beauregard's bottled up. We'll get to that in a minute. But if you look here, City Point, Bermuda 100. So total casualties, I'm using 9,800 because it's split right in the middle. I always try when I'm doing these, and, and I know most of you know this, it's the, 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 the statistics, especially with casualties, is, is really tough, tough to pinpoint accurately, get it as close as possible. And that's about as close, I think, as it is, about 9,800. Uh, clear Confederate victory, I believe. Uh, well, Beauregard and Pickett, not that I believe, Beauregard and Pickett uh, were heroes in this. Pickett got uh, initially credited with saving Petersburg in the initial stages before, Beaure before uh, Beauregard could take full command because he didn't get up to Petersburg un until uh, till like May 10th. And already you got, you got a couple of these battles have been going on. Butler's reputation was tarnished, I think. You're all, you're all aware of that. And the 18th uh, Corps would be separated from the, uh, now that they're bottled up, uh, their, their, their 18th Corps will be uh, uh, sent up to the Army of the Potomac, and they will be engaged heavily uh, on June 3rd at Cold Harbor, heavily, um, minus the 9th. The 9th didn't get up there until really late. It was a problem with, with a couple of the ships. The ninth didn't get up there till uh, late uh, on the third, but the rest of the brigade was fully engaged in probably one of the worst positions on the right flank, the Union right flank. And the Tenth Corps will remain in Bermuda Hundred. The, the Bermuda Hundred, the troops will be in Bermuda Hundred until long after Lee surrendered at Appomattox. Um, but I want to show you. Oh, the Ninth New Jersey saves their colors. That's a big thing to me. There was a uh, their color sergeant George Myers. Uh, when the when the Union flank was getting crushed at Drury's Bluff, in the fog and all the confusion and the screams, um, and and so on, the color sergeant George Myers uh, took the flag off the staff, folded it up, and put it inside his shirt uh, uh, to to try to save the colors. Uh, and I I thought that was a a, a heroic uh, measure for him for him to, to do that, to recognize he didn't want to see the colors uh, taken. And then um, the Union Secure City Point. And this is something that I just don't think, I, I just, I don't think, I don't see it happening. I don't see historians talking a lot about this. Um, they secured City Point. When, 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 when the Army of James landed on May 5th, 1864, for this campaign, the city point will forever remain in Union hands. And you just look at the look at uh, how busy it was. All these ships arriving every day, making it one of the busiest ports at the time. 1,500 supplies daily, 25 engines, 275 boxcars, as far as mule wagons and all, all to feed 
more than 100,000 soldiers and 65,000 horses. And during the entire 10 month siege of Petersburg, in and around City Point, they're storing 9 million meals and 12,000 tons of oats. This is a huge logistical operation. And, and um, I, I just don't think, uh, I, and I actually saw uh, one historian who said, well, that's kind of bullshit. Uh, the Union would have eventually taken City Point. Well, would they? Who, 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 who says they would have? Suppose they didn't get it for another six months. Who knows, you know, there's, as you all know, there's a million what ifs in the, in, in the Civil War. But the one fact is that City Point, this huge logistical supply depot that supplied the Army of the Potomac for the rest of the war and became such an important uh, uh, background to it, uh, that was secured from May 5th and they held 30 days of supply of food. I, I, I don't believe the Confederates were ever in a position to hold 30 days supply of food and so on. And I realize the North had, had much more, uh, uh, you know, much money and all. Now this, this, this uh, picture here, this uh, map here rather, uh, again, another crude one and, and, and this, these lines would have varied month to month and so on and so forth. But just to give you the overall point that uh, the one thing the Union was especially able to do with the U.S. Military Railroad was run a railroad off of the Petersburg and City Point Railroad behind the Union lines um, to do all that supplying during the siege of Petersburg. So without that, who knows what would have happened with the Union supply. So um, I, I see it as sort of an indirect... Uh, uh result it certainly you know uh, am i giving butler credit for that no, you know no i'm not i'm just saying that the the overall campaign uh this was one of the outcomes that just doesn't get discussed so could could the union have taken uh Butler have captured Petersburg and there's so much talk about it. oh yeah in hindsight yeah he could have and when you look at the numbers, he should have, but it wasn't, it wasn't his goal. It wasn't his objective. Um, he could have taken, he could have taken Petersburg. He could have taken Richmond, but I don't believe he could have taken both. 39,000 troops sounds like a lot of troops, but in order for him to, to capture Petersburg and Richmond, he just, he, I, I don't think any general could have done it. He would have had to capture and hold Petersburg. And once he did that, you'd have had every Southern troop from Southwest heading towards Petersburg. He, he would have had to hold and capture Petersburg. He would have had to defend his rear at Bermuda 100 and his supply base at City Point and attack Richmond. There's just no way. I, 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 would, I, would, I, I, just, I don't see that happening, even with a good general and 39,000 troops. I just don't see it happen. So let me read your Grant statement. This is what this is what Grant told Butler in the very beginning. And I'm going to I'm going to say quote and I'll end with the unquote with it. The fact that has already been stated, that is that Richmond is to be your objective point and that there is to be cooperation between your force and the Army of the Potomac must be your guide. This indicates the necessity of holding close to the south bank of the James River as you advance. Then, should the enemy be forced into his entrenchments in Richmond, the Army of the Potomac would follow, and by means of transports, the two armies will become a unit. Now, that, to me, doesn't say anything like you should take Petersburg. And yet, in his memoirs, <laughs> Grant would later write, quote, he neglected to attack Petersburg, which was almost defenseless. I'm a Grant man, believe me, I, I, I really am. I think he's probably, if not the best general in the Civil War, I, 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 just a whole lot of respect for uh, the, uh, the, the shoulders of uh, Ulysses S. Grant. But I just don't know how, when you tell the guy to advance towards Richmond and, late, and then years later in your memoirs, you criticize them for neglecting to attack Petersburg. And that's what a lot of historians do today. 
and if you look at it, yeah, he could have. He and and he probably should have. But that's probably it. So I'll end with uh, just a couple more slides here. The overall casualties for the ninth. Um, it's a lot of killed, wounded. Again, 45 that that uh, died in Andersonville prison. And there were two Medal of Honor winners at at the during the Bermuda Hunter campaign. Uh, well, there were actually three, but the third one happened like in June. Uh, and I'm I'm talking tonight about the campaign uh, from May 5th to May 20th, which is generally accepted as the Bermuda Hundred campaign. There were actions later when Butler tried to attack uh, Petersburg in uh, late May and in uh, early June, which failed. And uh, there was a, a Medal of Honor winner there. But during the, the campaign that I'm talking about tonight from May 5th, excuse me, to May 20th, um, Madison Drake would receive the Medal of Honor from the 9th New Jersey, and the other guy was in the, uh, I believe, we got it written here somewhere, I want to say the 87th Pennsylvania. Um, and Madison Drake would also, he'd be captured at Drury's Bluff, but he escaped. They were, he was being transported on a train down to South Carolina from, from Libby Prison when, um, when uh, he, he jumped the train and somehow was able to make his way back to Union Lines. The only monument that I'm aware of, this is at New Bern, some of you may have been there, New Bern National Cemetery. It's the only monument that I'm aware of to the Ninth. Beautiful, beautiful monument. And a lot of the Ninth veterans um, buried there. And this memorial, I think for those familiar with Find a Grave, um, the guy that put this together, 782 uh, members he's tracked down. I think this is phenomenal. Uh, a guy named Greg Speciali, I guess it is. Uh, the only thing, <laughs> he's got my, my ancestor, Lewis Murphy, wrong. If you go and find a grave, I have the right information. I tried to contact this guy. He's not accepting any uh, email uh, information anymore, but he's got him buried in Salem City, uh, which is, he's not. Baptist Church. I found the document that says that. All it says is, I buried at the Baptist Cemetery in Salem. Well, yeah, he is at a Baptist cemetery in Pedricktown, First Baptist Church, which is in Salem County, which my brother and I have been there and uh, seen, we got, you know, all the documentation and all that. But uh, other than that mistake there, it's, uh, it's you know, kudos to the guy for putting this together. And I know most of you that uh, are, are into this can appreciate that.